I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for being here. This is a tremendous uh, turnout for us and it's so good to see all of you. Many familiar faces, yeah. um, but uh, several new ones as well. And uh, certainly from outside our little community here in Vermont. So welcome. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, I'm Gloria Palmer. I'm the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. I'm very excited about tonight's program and grateful for the support of Northshire Bookstore in helping to promote this event. They are also a gold level sponsor of our uh, organization and that means a lot. So thank you, Northshire Bookstore. Um, let's see, this program will begin with a conversation between Julia Alvarez and Barbara Morrow. Barbara is the co-founder of Northshire Bookstore. Um, when we get to the question uh, portion, um, we will, um, because this is a large group and, it's, and it is on Zoom, it's, uh, we found the best way to handle Q&A is in a chat box. So I will serve as moderator and I will read your questions aloud. I can't guarantee that I will get to every question um, or comment, but I'll do my best. Um, it should be done by seven o'clock. Before I turn things over to Barbara, I'd like to tell you a little bit about her. Barbara Morrow has been a long fan of Julia's novels and has had the privilege of welcoming her to the Northshire for many of her books in the past. Hosting author events has been one of Barbara's favorite roles in the bookstore, learning from authors herself what the creative process is in creating a work of fiction enhances the reading of the work and meeting so many authors over the years has been a joy to her. Barbara has also been very involved with Green Mountain Academy, having served on our board and as president for a term. She recently served on a subcommittee of our program committee, helping to develop programs in our Women 2020 series and playing a key role in bringing Julia to us. As I said earlier, she is a co-founder of our community's beloved Northshire Bookstore. And Barbara, I'd like to thank you for participating in this program. Barbara will do the honors of introducing Julia and begin their conversation. Enjoy this program, everyone. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I am thrilled to be here this evening with Julia Alvarez, who um, is, as Gloria said, um, one of my most favorite people and, and, most, and favorite authors. Um, and we, we go way back. Julia has, has written a number of um, books, both fiction, nonfiction, poetry, children's books, young adult books. Um, it, it's amazing. And, it, and um, tonight we are here to uh, celebrate her most recent book of fiction uh, called Afterlife. Um, I, I also wanted to just mention, I think most of you know that Julia is, um, has been living in Vermont for many, many years. Uh, she was writer in residence uh, at Middlebury College until she retired not too long ago. And she and her husband, Bill, uh, live up in, in um, near outside of Middlebury. And uh, what, one of the things I love about this book, Afterlife, is that it is set in Vermont, and it, it all seems very familiar, and it will to you too, I'm sure. Um, Julia, the first question I wanted to ask you is, the, the title, Afterlife, appears to have a dual meaning, that of Antonia's life as a recent widow, and that of her husband who has died. Can you address that? Thank you, Barbara. But first I wanna thank Gloria and the Green Mountain Academy um, for inviting me and you and Ed for being such um, supportive uh, people to writers all over the country. But to me, when I started out and you know, not many people knew about me when I, my first novel came out. And of course, Northshire had me there and it was a wonderful um, 
just warm feeling going into the bookstore and you've been with me all along. So I feel very grateful. You are an institution, not just in the state, but uh, uh, for independent bookstores all around the country. So thank you so much. And uh, to your question about the title, um, I think at first it made my publisher a little nervous because they, you know, they worry how, how are people, you know, people, make on the spot decisions and a novel called Afterlife, will they think it's a religious track or, you know, um, something very unpleasant and so forth. I, you know, I, they, I don't know what the, the, the worry about it was, but I was so sure that I wanted this because it was for me a title that unpacked a lot of what the novel is about. As you mentioned, um, uh, you know, uh, Antonia, when, when we first meet her, um, she's all of a sudden, you know, uh, her life has come apart um, and the old life is over. So she's going to be living um, a new life. And for those of us who have grown older, we know that a life involves many little deaths along the way. And so if we're lucky and resilient and keep our minds and hearts open, we get to live an afterlife after that life is over. So in part, it's it's about what life she's going to be living now, that the world that she planned for herself, the life she planned for herself is um, over at the very start of the novel. And the other thing is she has lost her husband and uh, uh, she doesn't have some faith um, that makes her believe in an afterlife, but she comes to an understanding of how um, when you lose people, you die. Uh, if you let the things that they represented and the ways that they were die um, with them, that somehow that's a real death. So how to keep alive the best in the people that we lose um, by living uh, those qualities in our own lives and in our own way. So it just unpacks a lot of different aspects of the novel. Um, I think that the title does. Afterlife deals with so many of the issues we are coping with in our society today. Um, migrants and, and the menace they are subjected to, isolation and loneliness, family relationships and self-worth, mental illness, mm. spirituality. Do you consider yourself more of an optimist or a realist? <laughs> Huh? Depends what time of day you get me, Barbara. <laughs> and as we all know, with this moment that we're living, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a struggle. And uh, a struggle. I remember when I was, what I thought was already an older woman of 45, a much older friend, um, about 30 years older than me, uh, then, uh, told me that that part of the part of the task of getting older. Is to is to stay positive, to to put your check mark on the side of light um, and life and joy, even not not burying your head in the sand, but that you owe it to the younger generations. That part of our job is to um, is to be you know kind of a, a support to them and to keep hope and to and to join in their struggles and and. Someone once sat in the front row of um, our moment of, of uh, being young and clapped and, and came to our graduations and made a big deal over our, our recitals or performances. And now it's our job. So I think it's, I'm, I don't think I'm naturally an optimist because I see too much of everything, but I think I struggle for that to be just a little, um, a little few drops more than the glass uh, half empty so that it goes into full. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a, I, I would say, I don't know if it's realist, it's, um, but, but I, but I do think it's, it's, um, you know, it's something that I feel that I owe and a responsibility uh, to my community and my family and friends and my readers. Can, can you talk a little bit about the topic of um, migrants coming 
to Vermont and uh, the whole issue of uh, what they're up against. Except, yeah, this is, as you know, I don't know down in Manchester uh, what it's, you know, what the situation is, but here in, in Addison County, we have a lot of dairy farms, small dairy farms, and uh, many of them um, go bankrupt and are closing up uh, because farmers here are struggling to find a workforce that is willing to work, uh, you know, basically 24 seven and around the clock, or not around the clock, but also calendar uh, when you farm. And uh, when I first came to Vermont uh, for the job at Middlebury in 1988, you know, I remember my friends saying, oh, you're going to the Latino compromise state of Vermont. You know, what are you going to do up there? And uh, there weren't that many Latinos. I think the 2000 uh, census had 5,004 Latinos in the whole state. That's like a New York City block. Um, so, but in the last 20 years or so, we've seen an influx of uh, migrant workers undocumented who are now working in many of the farms surrounding us and the population is booming and many have children and, look, and many of those children are American citizens born here. They're showing up in the schools. Uh, um, you know, they go to the open door clinic, to the hospital. So it's a, it's a real transformation of um, the demographics here. And uh, it's been, um, you know, it's been challenging because uh, many are undocumented and uh, they don't feel safe going out in public. They're very visible since it is such a homogeneous state. Um, now more and more services are available to them. But part of the reason I would get called a lot is because everyone knew that Bill Eichner's wife, she spoke some Spanish. And so they'd call me up because I could come if there was some emergency at the hospital or a farmer needed help with a worker that didn't understand how the milking machine worked. Uh, <laughs> And that was, that was a stretch for me. So yeah, I, I, it's really a changing demographic, but I must say our little county here has been very welcoming. And uh, the police department in Middlebury um, issued a, a statement some years back that they were not an arm of um, immigration uh, and customs enforcement, that they, they weren't gonna be stopping people and checking their, their document status if, you know, they were out and about. So um, it's been, I think, a challenge uh, and, and painful to see, um, you know, immigration, um, you know, it'd be so unwelcoming and thinking of my own um, entry into this country in 1960. Which, uh, which you've addressed uh, in, in depth in, in previous novels. Um, which I, um, we can come back to maybe. Um, what I love about your characters is that they are imbued with such humanity and they're neither all good nor all bad. They're from fractured to saint-like. Can you describe the different attributes of your characters and how you go about forming them? It's, it's interesting, you know, I, um, Part of, the, part of what the novel deals with is um, the ways in which we instantly classify people and other them, you know. Um, and Antonia, the main character, is not, uh, is prone to this too, you know. There, there's certain kinds of types of people that she already thinks she knows who they are. And as she calls her, she puts, sometimes she throws them down the othering chute. Oh, there goes the sheriff. He's going to be a certain kind of person. This is the way to, you know, address him. Oh, the farmer next door who, you know, had a sign up that said, take Vermont back. Oh, he's a certain kind of person. So she herself is constantly doing that. Um, and she does it. You do that in families. Oh, that's the generous sister. Oh, that's the, uh, you know, sister with a temper. Oh, that, you know, we, we fit people into these roles. But part of what I'm interested in is what happens if you shift that a little more and they become more complicated. So they're not just what you expected. And that keeps happening to Antonia. 
Uh, help comes from unexpected places. And uh, she herself is aware of her own diversity and complexity. Because we talk about diversity in terms of other people, you know, in a community. But the diversity inside ourselves, you know, how we have very complex uh, interactions between different voices in our heads. And I'm interested in that. I think a character is much more interesting um, when they have that, even if you are going to have a villain, I always used to tell that to my writing workshop uh, students, even if you're gonna have a villain, put one really lovely quality in them. It, it, just, it just complicates and rounds the character. And the minute that someone is very, you know, defined in a narrative, I become very curious about them. You know, I, I just, you know, I, I just want to know a little more. And for me, it complicates a narrative. So, yeah, I hope the characters in Afterlife from the farmer next door, um, who very right wing and tough, uh, or so Antonia discovers other things in him and the sheriff who turns out to be a sweetheart in some ways. Um, yeah, I, I want that in my characters. That's, I love that about your characters. Um, at one point, Ant Antonia says, and I'm quoting, perhaps grief will be good for her work, unquote. Can you talk about imagination and how it can see us through difficult moments? Well, she I think soon after she decides, if that's the case, no thanks. <laughs> she wants her husband, Sam, back. If grief is gonna be, if losing him is gonna be for her work, no thanks. <laughs> uh, but um, what, what about, I think the thing that I feel, I'm feeling it very much these days with uh, these times we're living in and the challenges and, and the news and the, and the anguish um, for all kinds of reasons that we're experiencing, that I go to books, not because they're gonna take it away or escapism. Um, in fact, um, I don't wanna to go to books that are going to completely let me off the hook because what I want is to feel accompanied. And I want um, to read and feel that I'm not alone in this moment that I'm going through. I want to stay open to the moment, but I also feel like the imagination posits another paradigm than the one I'm caught in. It allows for other possibilities. And I find that hopeful. And if they're talking about a situation, I mean, before we went into lockdown down and Bill and I sheltered in place, I, I thought, oh, that's right. You're an English major. Remember the Decameron? It's about a plague in Italy in the 1500s. And the people have to leave the city and they tell each other stories. And my last rush to the library before it closed was to get uh, the audio and the books, the Decameron. Um, and part, I didn't get through them. <laughs> but part of it is I, I wanna know, I, I go to books to help me understand and make meaning of the moment. And I find that, I find that helpful. Um, it doesn't take away the sorrow or the loss or the, or the suffering, but it, it amplifies it. Afterlife would appear to be semi-autobiographical. Do you consider it creative nonfiction or faction? Uh, or faction? Faction. <laughs> like part that. fiction, part facts. Well, you know, I think, um, I think those, um, part of it is those borders, being an immigrant, I'm always transgressive of borders. I, because I think they're, they're much more like um, the seashore and shifting um, the sea and the land. And I think when I write um, what I've experienced and um, uh, things that have come into my life, either that have happened to me or that I've read about or experienced or um, been a witness to enter my fiction. Um, and, uh, and my fiction enters my life and changes me. 
every book has, has changed me, the writing and the research of it. So I think it's a relationship. And I think, um, I think all writers do this. Um, you know, I was on a panel with Julia Glass, wonderful novelist, and she was representing total fiction. And I guess I was asked to be sort of the speaker for autobiographical fiction. And she said, hey guys, I don't believe this. She said, all fiction is emotionally autobiographical, even if it doesn't seem to be about the author's own life. Because you write about characters and situations that you're intrigued about and passionate about and caught up in. And that has a lot to do with what you're interested in and what your passions are and what the things that you're trying to understand in your life are. So I think that my, my fiction might be more transparent than others, but I think it's, you know, I think it's, I use, as I say, I'm not interested in Julia Alvarez and her life and recording it, but she's my, my only way of getting out there in the world. She has all the senses I need to experience reality so that I know the, I have the material to write about. But ultimately, if stuff she brings in doesn't help a book or isn't part of it, it has no place in it. Sorry, Julia, you know, take <laughs> it back. So it's, it's um, you know, that's the way I think of, um, of, that, um, of that relationship between what is real and um, in, my, in my own life and what I fictionalize um, in, in writing a novel. So yeah, of course, you know, people who know me see a lot of me and Antonia and, uh, and Antonia has helped me to see things in myself that maybe I wouldn't have realized or I've liked some things and not liked some things of, her, of hers that, I'm, that I vow to improve on if it, I find them in myself. So it's a, you know, for me, writing is a way of life. So I don't, I, I find it hard to, to pull the threads apart. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. it's interesting. Um, there's a spiritual longing a questioning of the afterlife in your story. Is this personal for you? Well, I think when you lose people that are very important to you, um, there's a way in which, um, you know, you seek them. Uh, you, you're looking for them. Um, you hear their voices in your head. You have their memories in your in your. Um, heart and your spirit and so there's a way in which you um you want a relationship with that person you've lost and for me that is um it's it's both the yearning and, and the yearning is the relationship it's how that person stays alive um you know in in mexican tradition lore they say that a person dies three times the first time is when they take their last breath. The next time is when you put them in the ground uh, and bury them. And the last and final death is when no one remembers them, when no one says mm. their name, you know? And so I think that that relationship with, I, I'm very, you know, it's part of my culture too. Um, you know, uh, Latin culture is very imbued with the antepasados, the ancestors. Uh, you know, uh, your abuelita, your tatarabuela, your, you know, all of these people that you hear about growing up and that are, you're considered not a me, but a we, you know, a little bead in the necklace of the generations. And you have that, you know, mentality put into you. So yeah, I, I you know, I yearn for those I've lost and I'm determined not to lose them completely. Mm. So I remember them, you know, I, um, the days of their birth, important days in their lives, I, I recall them and I might have their picture out and put flowers or, or visit a place that was special. It's just a, a ritual that I, that I have. That's lovely. 
and, and that that is very very Latin, I think, in, in many Latin cultures, right? Yes, absolutely. Day of the Dead. Yes. I mean, if anybody has been in Mexico for Day of the Dead, which is actually three days, <laughs> you know, and they go to a cemetery, it's just, you know, it's just a huge fiesta. And it's a celebration, not grim. You know, people sometimes think, oh, it's so sad. No, you know, they bring favorite foods. They tell stories. They bring mariachis and play the music uh, that person loved. It's, it's, it's young, yeah, remembering, remembering them. Uh-huh. And, and you, you interweave Spanish and English in your prose. Um, I personally appreciated that because it kept me on my toes. I, I was able to uh, translate as I went along, but uh, is this, this is a, a stylistic um, um, thing that, that you do for authenticity? Is it, um, is it just part of, part of the story? Well, again, yeah, it would have to be part of the story for it to be present in the story because otherwise, you know, I, I, it, I'm not out to, um, to push an agenda in a story. Um, uh, I'm, I'm out to tell a story as a way of understanding things through plot and character. And if it's appropriate for a character, it will be, it will be in the story. But, you know, as with the question of autobiography or fiction, again, um, for those of us who are bicultural and bilingual, that is the language in our heads. We might be dominant in English, but the Spanish is part of an overlay. Even when it's all in English, I can hear that I'm speaking Spanish and English. The rhythms of my sentences, the way the syntax is put together, word choices. And I feel that when I read a Japanese American writer like Julio Suka, I feel like I have a Japanese sensibility going through her novel, The Buddha in the Attic. If I read um, you know, uh, a French author, I mean, I just feel like, or even if it's a French American, um, that, that, that those vocabularies and syntaxes get into the prose. And I feel like that's what's so vibrant and energetic and beautiful and powerful about the English language, that it is like this country full of immigrants. English is full of immigrants that we now have adopted and naturalized. I mean, ketchup comes from India, that word. Ketchup? I mean, ketchup is as American as you can get. We have fiesta. It's in the OED. You know, English is constantly, um, at first it seems odd, and then it absorbs the words and it grows the language and keeps it, it keeps it pulsating and rhythmic. And I think it's, it's a beautiful thing that ethnic um, uh, writers have brought into contemporary literature that they have really stretched not just content by bringing in all these stories from other traditions, but the language and syntax and the rhythm of the prose as well. And what I hope is that even a non-speaking Spanish um, reader of the story, that through context and character, they feel like they're speaking, they, they, like they speak Spanish too, like they, they get it, you know, because it suddenly becomes part of their own vocabulary and understanding. That's great. Can, can you comment on how we navigate our identities? Um, you, a Antonia is a Latina, she's a widow, um, she was a teacher, she is a sister, she is a community member, and, it, and she's all of the above. Yeah. But how, how do we navigate our identities? Well, now at this stage of life, I just turned 70 in March, and... Uh, uh, by the way, I think of this as the first novel I've written as an elder uh, because I think it is a novel that is very much imbued with a perspective of someone older as opposed to um, 
the young, eager, ambitious novels uh, that maybe I would have written in the past. Um, this has maybe more modulated ambitions, but it's a different kind of novel, I think. And part of the thing that, that happens as you get older is, um, you know, I, I used to think that uh, you found your true self and there you sunk your anchor and that's who you were. And that was part of being an elder. Come to find out that each stage of life, it all fall, falls apart in some ways, you know, uh, and you have to put it together in new combinations. Um, so there is, um, as I say, many little deaths, uh, many little shatterings, and um, hopefully um, you, you, bring, you, you bring some wisdom and experience and uh, faith that you can do it, but you, you, you put it together in new ways. There's new identities, you know, uh, who you were as a 40 year old is not who you're gonna be as a 50 year old or a 60 year old. And uh, you know, when we freeze people in those roles or type them in those roles, which I talked about before, you don't allow the possibility of growth. So I feel like I'm constantly redefining um, identities and uh, different balances work and are more accurate and authentic to who I am in the moment. And, um, and that shift is also happening in the people around me. And I think it's, it's um, you know, it, it's, I think it's exciting and hopeful because it means that you're always growing. Um, so yeah, I think there are many identities that Antonia has and part of what we witness and experience through her story is seeing our, how those are changed and challenged and enlarged and the tendency to want to close down and protect and be safe in little gated communities of your certainties. So, you know, constantly um, we're seeing that happening in, in Antonia's life and in our own if we pay attention. Hmm. So true. Um, your fiction is often described as storytelling. Is all fiction storytelling or is it a craft unto itself? Oh, I think, you know, fiction is a more maybe sophisticated um, term for what is so native to the human critter. We don't... Um, we're not honeybees, we don't make hives and, and produce honey. Um, we don't, you know, we're, we're the critter that, that tells stories. Um, we, we arrange experience and narratives that make meaning and, uh, and give us um, an understanding and, uh, and delight us and uh, distract us sometimes um, and, and help us grow. So I think of, I think of the atoms that might form sophisticated fictions and great novels and literature and canonical works as at the seed of it is storytelling. And you know, I, I thought, well, when I entered American literature, I thought, gosh, you know, I wasn't a reader as a kid and uh, I didn't have readers in my family and uh, I didn't grow up loving books or being a bookworm. I entered literature in English, really. Um, but before that, I was surrounded by storytellers, best storytellers, the familia. I mean, there were doozies. And I thought, well, that, that isn't, that's like humble storytelling. That's not real storytelling. And then when I entered an MFA program and I learned about pacing and character and humor and complexity and twists of plot, I thought, wow, I've... All those people, some of them who couldn't even read and write, you know, the Campo people that I heard story from, they already had it, you know, um, in this supposedly uh, primitive form or humble form, but no, they have the instincts. And I remember something that Spike Lee said, one of the great lessons in his life and in mine at that moment and throughout my life is, that you can learn things from people who are dumber than you, or you <laughs> think they're dumber than you. 
but really they have the, they have it. And, uh, and you can learn a lot. Um, so for me, storytelling, it's all a trajectory, you know, and fiction is at its heart has to, I think in some way, engage your listener um, with some sort of a story. Mm, that's wonderful. There's a lot of discussion now about the lack of representation of Latinx writers in the publishing universe. Why do you think your books have garnered such broad acclaim when other Latinx writers have not reached such a wide audience? Well, one of the, one of the reasons is I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> When I started out, it wasn't easy. It was not easy. I have been working on Garcia Girls for over 15 years, and it didn't get published till I was 41. And I got so many rejections and so many letters uh, saying, you know, that they weren't interested. They were interested in more universal characters. I said, you know, Latinx people were 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 some suborder of humanity. It was not easy. I lucked out. I had a wonderful agent. I've since gone on to someone who works closely with her, but Susan Burkles, who took on Garcia Girls. And I think after a while, she spared telling me um, what number of rejection we were on. <laughs> you know, because when I started writing, Sandra Cisneros, whom she also represented, Denise Chavez, all of these people that we now know about and that are taught in universities, nobody knew us or wanted to publish us. Um, they didn't think it would sell. And she knocked on doors and she pretty much, in some ways, single-handedly got um, people to take, to take a big chance on us. So I think part of it is being around um, and, you know, them realizing uh, mainstream publishers that our books could sell. Right now, I mentioned before we, before we got started that uh, I just heard right before coming on that Rudolfo Anaya died, published in 1972, Bless Me Ultima. I still have the original cover and it was published by a small press Dona Huitol International, and when it sold 200,000 copies, mm. it was grabbed by a mainstream publisher and reissued. So I think what started to happen with authors like Maxine Hong Kingston and Rudolf Anaya is that mainstream publishers started to see that this was not, um, you know, sociology and some side uh, back room of literature, but that it was American literature. But as with all things, um, Barbara, and you, you know this, in, because you have shelved all kinds of books over time, so you see the changes. It, it both has happened during our lifetime, but it goes so slow in some ways, especially if you're the next generation up. Um, wanting to get that kind of um, uh, readership and acceptance in the wider culture. And I think part of the things we're seeing with Black Lives Matter in terms of um, policing and uh, representation and economic and, and social and medical access is that, um, is that these underrepresented communities um, are, are just, you know, <laughs> saying that's enough, you know. And I think what we see also with, um, with authors, uh, many of them, um, you know, knocking on, on the doors of publishers and making them accountable is the need to widen um, the perspective to, to, because, you know, they're creating culture. They're the ones promoting and pushing things out. And what percentage of, um, of their lists any season are um, writers of color or writers of other traditions? Um, and not just 
the authors, who are the editors, who are the publicists, um, you know, who are the people uh, that are kind of uh, creating culture for us? And are they accurate representations of all the people out there? So I think it's, I think it's, a, it, it's a painful time. We're all on a learning curve. I mean, I'm learning, you know, I'm, I'm, sometimes I think with everything that's going on um, in terms of cultural wars or, you know, um, the racial moment that we're in is, I feel like what I need to say is, um, I'm listening, I'm learning, you know, be patient with me because I, I want, I, I want this moment not to be lost on me. And I, you know, I want to be one of the advocates and enlargers um, and protectors of, um, of a more beloved community world. Uh, so, yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's, there's so much to take in right now. Where do you come down on the controversy surrounding American dirt? I'm sure other people have asked you that in, in terms of the fact that an American woman, not a Latina, wrote that book and uh, about the migrant experience. Is, do you feel that, uh, that she, she had it right or that she had, it, had a right to, to write this book? Well, you know, I, again, the diversity even within the Latinx community did she get it right? My tradition is Dominican American. So I would not pick up on certain inaccuracies um, that might be in the book that a Mexican American reader or author would feel, um, you know, uh, was missing or inaccurate or misrepresented or distorted. I wouldn't have those kinds of censors out. I did blurb the book. I got very uh, caught up in it. Part mm -hmm. of what to me was uh, very powerful in the book was it represented um, the refugee experience uh, on the run from a female body point of view. Because this is a woman with a young son she's trying to protect. And I was totally into the drama of that. When it was sent to me to blurb, there was a cover letter that spoke of the author Puerto Rican grandmother. So my, my, my uh, radar was not that she wasn't Latina um, and also that she was married to um, what had been an undocumented immigrant. So my mind instantly went to the Southwest border. So I didn't have any kinds of guards up and I'm not going to renege on the fact that I got caught up in the novel. However, you know, I think that it was by the publisher a misrepresentation, which um, the op the optics of it, if nothing else, that um, you know, along comes a person and they're spun as a authentic Latina, and this is the novel about the experience, where all these other um, authors have been writing about it, uh, not getting coverage and uh, being rejected. It just felt um, there was a, a lack of awareness and sensitivity. And, um, and rightly, um, they confronted it. And for that, I think it's going to be, it's been painful, but a growing experience. By the same token, it instantly became so virulent and uh, unhelpful that I didn't, I didn't want to enter that frame and be caught in that paradigm of either or and who was right and who was wrong. I thought what was needed was a conversation and, um, and addressing the, the real issues underneath, underneath the anger at this author. Uh, you know, uh, I, I often quote when I'm asked about this, um, something I heard the civil rights activist Ruby Sales say that when she enters a really charged, angry confrontation where maybe she, there's some white supremacists there and there's some black activists that they're just 
furious and shouting and that, that her first question to the group is, okay, where does it hurt? Like, what's going on here that we need to address um, as a community? Because we need all hands on deck. And I think that's the tenor that, um, mm -hmm. that I want in these conversations. But you don't get there without going through some of that fury and anger and disappointment. But what it says is that there is a, a hurt and a wound and, um, uh, and inequality and injustice there that does need to be addressed. Um, and we all need to address it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, poetry plays a large part in your life. When, when does poetry serve as a form of expression? Well, it's interesting, you know, I, I, I don't, I haven't, um, I don't have an exact um, way to think of when and, and why. I just know that um, sometimes I'm just drawn to it as um, a kind of, certain kinds of moments, like these moments we're living now, I find I really need to be reading poetry. Um, that somehow it's, um, it's, it's so close to the bone and it's so, it's for me, um, it's language pushing against the silence. It's language pushing against what can't be put into words often. It's, um, and so it just feels like um, a landscape of discovery and reflection. And it's quieter than prose in some ways. You know, um, it, it's both quieter and, and sometimes it feels larger than, than prose. You're not, you don't have all these characters and their families and where the kids are going to school and what they're eating for supper in this scene. It's just closer to the bone and uh, it sharpens something in me. And it has a way of stirring the mystery in me in a way that is um, more um, immediate and charged. Um, and it also is something they, you know, a lot of times um, when I'm talking to someone that, who fears poetry, they say, I just don't get it. You know, I, I just, it's hard for me. I don't get it. And I think, well, I think maybe part of the problem is if you're going to it thinking there's something to get, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge ocean to wade in and to reread. That's a wonderful thing about poetry. You know, you can reread and reread it and, um, and still get something, you know, it, it, it changes and grows. And, uh, you know, it, I just find that certain moments, um, I, 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 need, I need poetry uh, mm. to accompany me. First thing in the morning, I like to start with reading poems. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Right now, my sister gave me a book, um, uh, and they are, it's an amazing little book, um, written 400 BC, Buddhist nuns, Bud elder Buddhist nuns, poems by them. Who knew, right? Written 2,500 years ago. And... Nothing new under the sun. Um, the different little things they talk about before they became nuns, what their lives were like. But so stark and so sharp that um, it, just, it just delights me to, to know that I'm connected to these women 2,500 years before me. Um, and, and the lyric somehow sharpens the connection. Your, your family experienced an author, authoritarian regime. How would you compare aspects of what we are experiencing today? And we don't have to go deep into politics. 
if you don't want to, but to to the Trujillo regime. I mean, it is it like deja vu? It certainly is. You know, um, I feel like so many things that uh, that resonate for me about um, the strong uh, strongman leader uh, imposing his way um, on a population and uh, and often brutal in their responses um, to the rights of citizens, especially those that they don't want to be part of their controlled um, nation uh, domain. Uh, we're, I, I'm seeing in this, in this moment we're living, along with something that, you know, I always would question my parents about. 31 years we had this dictator and so many people, you know, in retrospect, they say they didn't want him. Um, you know, how, how could people let it happen? And then you look at the Congress that he had. We had a Congress <laughs> and everybody uh, fell in line that wanted to stay um, alive in that, in that situation. Um, and so it's not just what I, what I experienced to it. Was, it isn't just one person. A dictatorship works because there's a little dictator that gets implanted um, in the population. And people uh, have varying degrees of enabling and collaborating, including institutions um, in place that are supposed to be balances and protect us. At some point, um, we see them malfunctioning. And, um, you know, we see um, elections rigged and people left off rosters and, and uh, blocked from uh, voting. Uh, and that, that all happened in the DR. And it usually starts, um, you know, small. And what happened in the Dominican Republic that people um, now historians comment on is that Trujillo came in power and he was a military guy that actually had been put in place by uh, the US occupation before they left the country. Uh, they left their friend that they had trained in place. Uh, but maybe he would have fallen, uh, you know, in a couple of years. But we had a huge cyclone that came in October 1930. And um, it totally decimated the country. It, the country went into lockdown. Uh, people were afraid. Um, and fear is a great enabler of a strong man putting his control over a country. So, you know, I do worry about um, this pandemic. <laughs> and I am um, worried, but also hardened um, by so many young people um, out on the streets and not letting um, a situation that's very difficult and frightening keep them from protesting and showing up. Uh, so it's a positive sign, you know, um, to see that. When we came into this country in 1960 and we turned on the TV and Papi had told us we'd come to the land of the free, the home of the brave, where people have their rights, and we see on TV these black people marching, hoses turned on them, dogs at them. And, you know, I remember the moment of feeling we did come. This, this is the land of the free or just is, is the land of the free for certain kinds of people. I suddenly, my faith was, you know, very challenged, but then People were marching, you know, the civil rights movement. They were joining. And that, that was something I hadn't seen back home. And that did feel like a hopeful sign that, you know, that this was a society where still in experiment, but where people were holding it to the values that it said it held dear. Yeah, this, 
Um, before we, we go to questions, I want to mention your new children's book, which is absolutely beautiful. I don't know if, if uh, you can all see it, but it's called Already a Butterfly, a Meditation Story. When do you decide to, to write a children's book or a young adult book as opposed to a book for an adult? Again, you know, to say um, that I decide, um, maybe it, it's so messy a process that I, I think it's just, <clears throat> you know, I, I am caught up maybe with a situation or with a character or um, something comes in my life and I think of it as a pebble in my shoe. I suddenly am, I can't seem to shake it out. And then, you know, it's, it seems to find what its form and audience will be. So um, what brought this about already a butterfly that afterward describes it, that I was down in the Dominican Republic working with an organization for young girls um, called Mariposa DR Foundation. And th this is an amazing organization started by an American woman for young street <laughs> girls to educate them, to give them a profession. And uh, they're called Mariposas, butterflies, because uh, the woman, uh, Tricia, uh, Trisha, Patricia, was inspired when she read in the time of the butterflies to go down there and start this organization. So wow. I love it when books do that, you know, it leads mm. someone to their passion. And so she started this organization um, and uh, I was there volunteering with two, my two granddaughters. And I noticed that these girls, they were gaining so many skills and so many things were entering their lives and they were so scattered. And meditation has really helped me uh, to focus and to um, learn to, you know, come down and center through all the distractions and all the challenges that come into a life, good and bad. And so I convinced Tricia to start a meditation practice for the girls, a mindfulness practice. And now it's something they do every day um, before they start the day and at the end of the day. And you know, it's anecdotal, but she says it's really made a difference. And so uh, the story, I wrote the story to sort of explain, not explain, to sort of present um, uh, how it's useful meditation by telling the story of a Mari Posa. Her name is Mari. Uh, her last name is Posa. You put them together, you get Mari Posa. For the bilingual reader, they know that means butterfly. But a, a, about a Mari that um, ha, doesn't feel like she is a butterfly. And she has to learn to um, quiet down and not push herself so hard and, and find the mariposa in her. So that's how it came. And I, we, it was really written two years ago, but we lucked out Raul Colón, a wonderful illustrator and a children's book author, wonderful children's book author in his own right, um, agreed to do the illustrations, but he had suddenly become so famous, winning so many prizes that there was a line out the door. And so we had to wait for him to, uh, to be ready to tackle this project. And I'm so glad we did because he did an amazing job. Just the illustrations are a kind of meditation. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you, Barbara. Yes. Two books born in a pandemic. Now that's a record, right? <laughs> Afterlife in April and, and already a butterfly in June. Uh, Gloria, shall, shall we turn to questions? Yes. Um, and um, for those of you who joined us late, um, we're going to handle the questions uh, through the chat box. So if you have a question, please type it in there and I will um, go through and uh, read them aloud. Um, our first um, question, uh, Monica says, I love your early novels. Are the Garcia girls the same people as the four sisters in Afterlife? <laughs> well, not exactly. Um, not exactly the same, but I think uh, that 
she's identified something that that is, um, I guess, uh, character uh, thread in my work that I am very interested in sisters. Um, and, and four seems to be a number that I'm comfortable with. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of four sisters. Uh, so, of course, there's that uh, autobiographical element. Um, I also, you know, meet up our sisters. I didn't plan it, but those were four sisters. And in other ones of my novels, there's women and their relationship to each other, whether it's by blood or friendship um, or some sort of um, connecting passion have been, are very important to me. And I think it's partly because, um, because I am female and I think I've always been interested in, in writing to, um, to what I, when I started as, out as a reader, felt like gaps on the shelf. Um, so I always loved books about sisters. I loved Little Women. I loved Jane Austen. Uh, you know, any, any novel that had sisters in it, um, I wanted to learn from them and see how their sisterhoods worked. So young, yeah. but they're not the same. So, so Julia, are you uh, one of uh, sisters? Yes. Sisters? Yeah. And how many, do you, how many sisters? We're four. Four, uh, okay. Four sisters. Um, mm -hmm. And as we always used to say, no brothers that we know of. <laughs> Coming from a Latin culture, you, you, you have to have that. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, why did you decide to write about immigrants and their journey? Again, <clears throat> You know, it's, uh, I think that writers um, address, like I say, the pebbles in their shoe, the things that perplex them, disturb them, um, that they keep thinking about. And uh, if you're an immigrant yourself, if you are, um, you know, um, come from a Latinx background, of course you're interested in the theme and you're interested in the, in the situation, the moment that you're living in, um, also your community. And so this is some, you know, what is going on with immigration is, um, is something that is so much now a part of what we're tackling with um, as, a, as a country and globally. You know, uh, Toni Morrison said that, that the, um, that the big, what, what she saw as the biggest um, challenges and was not, um, or, or the biggest ways in which we were going to have to deal with, with uh, our global population was, uh, was not the technology. Um, she didn't even say, you know, climate issues. She said the huge diasporas of people people on the move, populations uprooted. And, uh, uh, you know, and this country is founded on that. I mean, this country is founded uh, by the story of up uprootedness uh, and of uprooting others. So it's, it's very much in our DNA, uh, nationally and I think globally. Do you have a Mexican audience and are you publishing in Spanish? I don't know, um, you know, I write in English uh, because that became my, um, the, the language that I learned to craft and that I came of age in, in terms of um, as, as a writer and as a reader. Um, so I don't really know or track um, I don't even do it in this country, who my readers are. That's why it's such a surprise to see all of you out there. Um, but um, I know that Afterlife is already coming out in September in Spanish. And um, I already was sent last night my first review um, by someone who read a, a preview of, um, of the book coming out in Spanish. So I know that Dominicans, you know, um, hold on to you forever, thank God. Uh, they, 
They never throw you away. So um, they they claim me as their own, even if I, I write in English. So when the novel comes out in Spanish, um, people there are eager to, to read it because not every Dominican reads in English. But it's also where I can get in trouble because when the books are only in English, a lot of relatives are not reading them. <laughs> so they, they don't say, what do you mean your grandfather? I say, no, 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 that's a fictional grandfather. Don't tell me that's a fictional grandfather. <laughs> so it's also a, a trepidation when it comes out um, in your own um, linguistic neighborhood and uh, culture. Going back to maybe to sisterhood, um, could you talk about your, talk a little bit about your sisters and your nuclear family and why it wider? <clears throat> well, <laughs> this will come uh, as a shock and I, sometimes I say it, I think to get um, a kind of shocked response. But my father was the youngest of 25 kids. <gasps> the first one had 10 and then she died. And I always say, amazingly, not in childbirth. Uh, she, she died and then he married the first wife's um, first cousin and had 15 kids. Um, and uh, my father was the youngest of those 15. So when he was, the day he was born, my, his, the oldest brother by the same mother had just graduated from law school so that my, they talk about the telegrams because that's how people communicate communicated crossing from the capital um this uh, new lawyer saying i just have my law degree and his mother saying you just have a little brother uh, whom she had close to 50 um when she was 50 years old so i'm saying this by way of saying that when you say family i think of a clan i think of an extended familia and uh, it's wonderful. You grow up with so many storytellers. You grow up with a village, an inbuilt village. What's difficult about it is that when you lose, you start losing people, you don't just lose one auntie and one uncle and a few cousins. You lose a whole phalanx of people. And it starts to feel like a huge loss, not, you know, amplified. So I think of all of that family as my family. But more immediately, my nuclear family, I do come from a, a family of all sisters. And I feel like um, my sisters are, they drive me batty, they drive me nuts. Uh, they read my novels for what, <laughs> you know, to get mad at sometimes. <laughs> but they're ultimately, they got my back front and sides covered. Um, they will, they will, I know they're there for me. And, all kinds of ways and I feel the same way too. And I think one of the things that was really important for us um, as new immigrants, and when we came, there weren't any Dominicans around. We were the only ones in our school. Um, now it seems impossible that in Nueva York, we were in a school and we were the only ones. But because I had sisters, we were going, we had community. We were all going through those challenges and we were all making different negotiations of them and different balances. So they're super important for me um, and have been in trying to um, understand um, the things that we have been through. And um, anyhow, you know, it's, and, some, and I totally get that it's tough having a writer in the family. I mean, a lot of conversations began, I'm going to tell you something, but you have to swear that you'll never write about it. I said, don't <laughs> tell me, don't tell me, because I won't even know. I'll be in the middle of a scene, and I'll put it in there, and it won't be till after it's published, and I hear from them, they say, it's in there. And I go, no, I made that up. No, you didn't. <laughs> and sometimes they remember things that I made up that didn't happen because they read about it and it seems so real that uh, our family history has grown <laughs> in terms of my fictions. Uh, that's great. 
Uh, another question is, what's your take on writers who write stories about others' experiences? I'm thinking of the help. I guess how well you do your research, how well you really um, absorb. I mean, I just read um, Colin McCann's A Paragon, uh, and it's about an Israeli and um, um, a West Bank Palestinian uh, father who both lose their, their daughters, uh, based on a true story, but it is a novel. Uh, very close, again, I don't know if you call that autobiographical or, or what, but it is, I mean, he, he joined those worlds. I mean, he was there for seven years. He lived in their houses. He has the smells. He, they say um, it's, it's there, it's, it's them in that novel. So I think accuracy is important. And sometimes we feel like we're being accurate um, but we're not aware of inbuilt biases, which is part of o being accurate to overcome those. And when I read Help, I didn't, I, I something in me didn't feel um, that the Black experience was really, I, I put that, say, reading Beloved by Toni Morrison, and it just, it's so apparent to me. And, and sometimes it, it, it is that our biases because of where we come from and the ways in which we're not even aware of them render us, um, render it um, a real challenge as to whether we can really take on that subject. Um, and so we have to just be very clear with ourselves, well-meaningness, or curiosity can only carry us so far. Authenticity, and you know, it happens, you know, I, I, I get it because I can read a novel by a non-Dominican, even a Latinx author. When I read Mario Vargas Llosa's novel, um, The Death of the Goat, there, there are things in there that he got wrong. He really captured the Dominican mentality and the dictatorship and so on. But there's things in there that I read and I go, uh-uh, uh-uh, that, that's not Dominican. And um, even down to how he, uh, the word choice, you know, a Dominican will always say rice and beans, arroz con habichuelas. We always say it almost as if it's one word, arroz con habichuela because it's our staple in our diet. But he has a Dominican character, ask for a plate in a restaurant of habituelas con arroz. A Dominican would never say that. Mm -hmm. And one of the Dominican critics even had a joke in his uh, critique of the novel. He said, unless he gets it right in the next edition, instead of calling him Mario Vargas Llosa, we're gonna call him Mario Llosa Vargas. <laughs> which is not his name. So you pick up things. So how well you do your research is important. And how, how you know, how authentic you can be and true. Um, because that's a way of respecting the experience that you're writing about and the characters you're writing about. I'm sure Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, the author was really well-meaning, but the stereotypes gone with the wind, you know, not that it was trying to debunk stereotypes. It's, um, it typecasts a whole population there um, that can feel it's another way of erasure. Um, another question, I would love to hear about what it's like to work with a translator as an author who's bilingual for the books translated into Spanish. Is it fun to discuss alternatives, etc.? It drives them batty and it drives me batty. <laughs> when we came to this country, it was pre-bilingual education and we were not encouraged to keep up our Spanish. So as a result, um, I became English dominant. And so 
part of the thing is that I have oral Spanish. And of course, I kept going back. And my parents lived there the last decade of their life. They went back. And I was there constantly. So I have oral Spanish. And I hear it. But I'm not literary. I don't know how to craft the language and, and write in Spanish. But I can read a text and tell you where it's not accurate. But I can't tell you how to fix it. Now, won't that, wouldn't that drive a translator crazy? I just <laughs> got sent the manuscript of Masaya. One of the things I, I've insisted on, um, and my, my, um, my, my um, agent, Stuart Bernstein, is, is very supportive and pushes for, is that I, I need not just a, a translator into Spanish, I need a second reader who has the Dominican language and skills to be what I call my eyes in Dominican Spanish. So we have a wonderful translator, Mercedes Gould. She's Colombiana and she lives in Mexico. She has a wide range, range of Spanishes that she understands and navigates. But it takes a Dominican eye to catch here and there how the characters should be because of their Dominican of origin, when they go into, into Spanish, they should sound like Dominicans. So um, it's interesting places where I hear that it's, it's gone off. And then I have Ruth Herrera, besides Mercedes Gould doing the, the translation, who is the Dominican consultant, you could call her, that I say, Ruth, we wouldn't say it that way. And sometimes, you know, she's, she, my input helps them come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. right. But it's, it's difficult because some things you can't translate. Mm -hmm. Anne, uh, let's see, we have this, uh, Anne says this, there are at least two of us on the call who are Abbott Academy graduates from the 1970s oh, and familiar with your poem. What was your experience as an immigrant going to an all girls New England boarding school in the 1960s. I guess the poem they refer to as Abbott Academy, 1964. Uh, that, that was the poem that, refer, that it, uh, especially addresses the experience. <clears throat> we were, um, my sister and I, uh, older sister and I, um, well, the problem was that we were in a, in a school where some very, not very good things were happening to us. Um, a lot of um, bullying and discrimination and, and uh, very disheartening. And, um, and um, through a family history with Abbott Academy, uh, my mother wrote to the headmistress and somehow we got scholarships to go to this place called Abbott Academy. Uh, we did not want to go. Um, uh, boarding school was where you sent, uh, um, you know, uh, kids and forgot about them. We didn't w not want to leave our little um, four-year-old immigrant home, four-year Amer four American years old because I was fourteen, and go to this place in Massachusetts, a, a, a name hard to pronounce. And uh, and I remember when we got uh, before going um, the list of things we were to bring. And we didn't know what half of the things were. Saddle shoes? Y que lo que saddle shoes? We were to bring two tea dresses? Tea dresses. We went to Gertz, the local department store, and the sales lady didn't know what a tea dress was either. <laughs> so there was, a, there was a big, huge learning curve. And uh, to suddenly be these two, um, you know, Dominican girls in this world, it was a second immigration and very challenging. Um, but, and it was very difficult. Um, I think um, for me, especially, um, I, I was very homesick. I was, you know, young for my class and uh, I longed to go home, but I, now in retrospect, 
um, being in a community of all girls with um, these really, you know, these characters for teachers and, and some of them wonderful, smart, Emily Dickinson type teachers um, gave me some models of, um, of female possibility which I was not encountering in my Latinx culture at all. You know, most of my cousins were having quinceaneras and getting married uh, and starting families in their teens. So this opened up a world for me. And of course, I fell in love with poetry there and had wonderful English teachers, one of whom, which really was the person that got me started, Ruth Stevenson, I'm still in touch with her. She is my muse, my madrina. Um, and she, you know, it, it wasn't very good poetry, but she encouraged it. And she, um, she fanned those flames. So it, it ended up being a very painful experience, at the, but one through which I grew. And I've often found that anyhow in my life that these uh, things that come in that are huge challenges and seem to, you know, uh-huh break you apart, can, can, as Rebecca Soltnet, the writer says, out of the, in, inside the word emergency is the, is the verb emerge. And so it was, ended up being a powerful experience. And, and my avid classmates and I now get together. Um, we used to do it every year. Now it's every other year. And 40 of us show up and have our own reunion because the school is gone. It's been absorbed by Phillips and over Academy, but it's not the same as just going to our, to our, you know, female group. And so we have our unreunion um, and get together. <laughs> That's great. We're going to do just two more questions. Um, one is my, uh, Sally says, my favorite line in afterlife is about imbuing what is good in a lost loved one into one's own life. Can you talk about that and how that affects future generations? Huh. Oh, that is amazing. You, to also ask how you're, how you're not just inheriting it, but sending it forward. I think being a teacher is a way that you do that. Um, I think being around young people is essential. I, I, I just feel like I learned so much and, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm always so touched when they feel they can learn something from me actually. Um, but, you know, how we, you know, I, I, I think of it, okay, from my own experience, um, I had a wonderful mother-in-law and, She's the kind of mother-in-law, one of her lines gets into the, into the novel, um, who, whenever there was a tough situation, would kind of roll up her sleeves and say, well, let's see what love can do. And uh, that's not where I go <laughs> in challenging situations necessarily. Um, and she had amazing patience and tolerance. And sometimes when I feel like killing her son, <laughs> <laughs> I think of mom and I, I think, okay, I get it, mom. I'm hearing you. Let's see what love can do. So there's a way in which, you know, while I still remember the better angels of my nature, Lincoln is alive. Not just, in, you know, in history books or out there on a plaque. Uh, history, he is alive in me. When I think of the beloved community, Martin Luther King resurrects um, inside me and is alive again and vibrant. And, and I think that's true with, with the personal legacies that we get, um, you know, and the ones that we send forward. Um, and, and you don't even know. I mean, who would have thought that mom's little line, which was just something she said, you know, um, an old Nebraska farm woman, that that's a line that is luminous for me. Uh, so we don't even know uh, where we cast these little nets that will be important to someone going forward. So cast them, cast them far and wide. 
What, uh, okay, one more question. Uh, what do you do, what do you enjoy doing when you are not reading or writing? Oh boy. Yeah, it's, I've had to fight being a monoculture because as I know from my um, uh, environmental studies students, that is not a good thing. <laughs> you need diversity. Um, I, I, I have, I, I married a, a farm boy who loves gardening. So uh, part of the discoveries, I'm, I'm not a gardener, um, but is to discover in order to understand his passion, to accompany him in the garden. And after 31 years together, I'm allowed certain, to help out in certain chores and, uh, and to help harvest certain things. And, uh, and now I'm, I even have my input on, on what to grow and tend to certain beds. So uh, gardening is wonderful. The problem is you live in Vermont and it's not the tropics. You don't have a full year growing season. So what did he do? He bought a coffee farm in the DR <laughs> 25 years ago. And we were very involved in, in that project. We've since donated it to the Mariposa Foundation, as a matter of fact, um, mm. so that they can have a mountain campus. But um, gardening, um, being out in, in the natural world, how can you not, right, Barbara, when you live in Vermont? I mean, hikes, um, going to certain places and just feeling the beauty of this place that is such a blessing um, is something that I really enjoy. Um, what else? You know, one of the things I love about winter, um, and this might seem like, well, is that really an activity? I love gathering friends together around the table and uh, breaking bread together. Friendships have become really important. Um, the community. Um, I live in a small town of Weybridge. Um, town meeting day. Um, you know, we're, we're missing so many things that are markers in our community. Our town picnic, of course, has had to be canceled. Um, our festival on the green in Middlebury has had to be canceled. Our peasant market that happens every year. So these um, ways in which you, as you get older, you know, other people volunteered when you were younger to help these things keep going you're called on to do more of these projects. And uh, they're a way that, that really enriches my life and, and sometimes takes up a lot of my time. <laughs> so I, it's a balance uh, to keep the writing time also important. Yes. Nice. Julia, thank you so much. And I want to encourage everyone to read Afterlife if you haven't. Um, and it, it's, it's just a marvelous book that will touch you in so many different ways. And, um, it's just been wonderful having you on this, uh, Zoom program. <laughs> and, uh, well, the first time I do this virtually with you, Barbara, it's a first, right? It's and a first. I, it's yes. a first. And if I can encourage you, whether it's afterlife or, somebody else's book, a way to honor Rudy Anaya, um, you know, read one of his novels, read one of his books of stories, and order those books from your independent bookstores. It's something that has become really important, an activism thing. You wouldn't think it, but uh, for us in our community to keep our little Vermont bookshop alive, um, you know, encourage people to, to buy from their independent bookstores to keep this vibrant uh, and important institution that could go extinct um, if we don't support it by ordering your books and gifts from places like Northshire. Um, it's, it, it's important. It, it's not just promoting and pushing. It's, it's, um, it's important um, because we want these communities um, these places in our community to survive all kinds of pandemics, including the Amazon yeah. pandemic. <laughs> well, thank you again. It's thank you all. It's been wonderful to see you and to talk with you.
Gloria, thank you. thank you so much. And the Green Mountain Academy and uh, all of you yeah. leaders for, for joining us and delaying your suppers and <laughs> your walks on this beautiful evening. Um, thank you. Gracias. Gracias. Uh, thank, thank you, Julia. It was really an honor to have you with us. And um, Barbara, thank you for um, leading this conversation with her. And thank you, everyone, for being with us. I hope to see you at the next Green Mountain Academy event. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Adios. Okay. Bye. Adios. Bye. Adios. Adios. Yeah. Bye, Julia.